Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. The banner behind me invites you to a messy Christmas party. If you drive by it fast enough, you might think it says Mary. But look again, it says messy. Sunday, December 11th at 2.30 in the afternoon. There's a lot about, about this season of Advent that involves people trying to get everything right. We think we have to have everything just perfect. The lights on the house and the tree. You can't overcook the cookies. You have to get the decorations just right. Find the exact present that is going to make someone just happy for the rest of their life. Rarely does it turn out that way. But when God sent Jesus to us in a very messy kind of a way, in a stable with animals and a crying baby, with shepherds that were working, working late, wise men that didn't know where they were going or what they were doing, and Mary and Joseph trying to figure out who this baby would be and, and how to take care of God's son. That was not all clean and neat and laid out. Nobody else had to do that before them. Nobody has had to do it or ever will have to do it again. Yeah, Christmas was pretty messy and it's okay because God reaches out to us in all the ways that our lives are imperfect and meets us with his grace there. So come and enjoy a messy Christmas party with us a little bit early, December 11th, 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, if you want to stick around for dinner afterward at the community dinner, uh, you can make reservations for that on our website. Uh, we'd be glad to see you. But if you show up and we're not exactly all together, we'll just say, pardon the mess. We're still glad to see you. And now let's worship. This week in the course of our worship on Sunday morning, we're going to be decorating the tree behind me, the Chrismon tree. Chrismon is shorthand for Christ monogram. And the decorations that go on, which were cross-stitched a while back, I guess, by different people in the church, uh, each have a symbol of some aspect of the faith especially relating to Jesus. This one has a shell, which reminds us of his baptism and our own. This one has a star of David and a cross, reminding us that Jesus was the son of David, the Messiah that had been expected to be born in Bethlehem. This one has a butterfly. It's a symbol of the resurrection, a reminder of how a butterfly goes into a, or a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and comes out a butterfly, and how Jesus, after his death for us on the cross, was laid in the tomb, but was raised three days later in a far more wonderful way than he had been put in. I invite you right now to join me in a prayer. And you'll see on the screen that it incorporates the symbols of the things that we pray for or pray about. May God's spirit be with us in this time of prayer. Lord Jesus, Lamb of God, you gave your life for us. 
Help us to put aside those sins that you died to pardon. Rising from the dead, you bring new life. And so we ask your hope for those who grieve. Jesus, you are the anchor in all of life's storms. We pray to you for all who are troubled or who look to you for healing. Shepherd and tend your people, we pray, and shine your light on their path. Ruler of the earth, spread peace among the nations and send your justice, O Son of Righteousness. For with the Father and the Spirit, the kingdom is yours, and the glory now and forever. Amen. The 24th chapter of Matthew is one where a lot of Jesus' teachings about the end and the beginning of the age, let's put it that way, are put together side by side. At some points, he seems to be speaking about what many people at the time of his preaching were expecting and that would actually happen, a, a conflict between the people of Israel and the Roman Empire, one that did not go well for Judea. In other spots, he seems to be speaking about the end of this sort of world age that we live in and the beginning of the kingdom of God, about how God would roll everything up and start all over again. At some times and some points, it seems, well, we use the word apocalyptic, cataclysmic, cosmic. At other points, it sounds like a fresh start. At some points, it seems to deal with things on a huge and universal scale and on others, in a very personal kind of a way. And so all of that gets mashed up together. And today we hear one portion of that from Matthew 24, beginning at verse 36. And you can hear aspects of all of those things in his teaching here. He said, But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field together. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So here's a poem for late fall and early winter. 
It was written by somebody who had been... Oh, start it again, okay? So here's a poem for late fall or early winter. It was written by someone who was overcome by a feeling that maybe his best days were past and it might be downhill for him the rest of the way. And he offers advice on what that would mean. He said, that time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day that after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away. Death's second self, which seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed by that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. Obviously enough, that was Shakespeare. Shakespeare, Sonnet 73. If it had a, a musical notation, it would be in a minor key. Shakespeare, telling people not to take things for granted. Telling them that you aren't going to be around forever, buddy, and neither will I. So don't get any ideas. Pay attention to what's in front of you. Pay attention to the people around you. Let them know how you feel. Because you don't want to leave them guessing about it. And that's not bad advice for anybody at any age. The awareness of endings, which is all over Matthew chapter 24. The awareness that things end is not only in Shakespeare and not only in, in the Bible, but it pervades a lot more things than we think about. Listen to the news and right now you'll hear how things are shifting in Washington as one party begins to prepare to hand power over to another. One Congress is ending and waiting to find out what the new one will be like. Pay attention to economics and you'll see how there are companies that are positioning themselves for a transition, long-term transition, away from oil and toward electric vehicles. You'll see them, even though they won't all admit it, trying to position themselves for climate change, for the end of one period of time and the beginning of another. It doesn't have to be anything that dramatic. If you look at sports and games, you'll find that they are totally tied into time. And they are very deeply affected with the awareness that there is a time limit on at least most games. Uh, football 
is a great one. In the fourth quarter of a, a game, the clock can become every bit as much of a factor as the, back, the bench. It can be every bit as much a factor as the weather in deciding what plays are going to be run. If you look at basketball, there are times when a team will be ahead, so they try to run down the clock, or behind, so they play more aggressively. If you watch a bowling match, and you get to about the ninth frame, sometimes you'll see that somebody who is behind by a significant amount may not even wait for the tenth frame, but start unlacing their shoes. They know what is coming. When the Scrabble tiles start getting low, everybody around the board starts looking at the remaining spaces, the remaining areas where they can play, with an increased focus. And if you stare at faces, you can sort of sometimes tell who may have a J or a V or a Q still in their hand. But if you want focus and an awareness of endings, look at musical chairs. Mere amateurs at that game, when they hear the music, they may be confident and they may start out each round nonchalantly looking around the room, watching other players, humming along with the music, absolutely convinced that the music, when it stops, will stop at the end of a phrase, a musical phrase. But it doesn't always do that. The serious competitor, the, the real musical chair player, will know that you might have one or two notes, and that's all or you might have the whole song. And so they've always got that impulse built into them to jump for a chair at the exact moment they need to do it. And the whole time that they're walking around and around the room, they are looking not at the players, but at whoever is controlling the music. And it's the person who has that edge to it who will end up being the champion. Now, musical chairs might be fun, but it's not exactly world-changing. Jesus, when he talks to his followers, in Matthew, in the times recorded in Matthew 24. He is talking about things that will be world-changing, but he encourages them to have that sense of immediacy, that sense of awareness, that sense of watchfulness, that sense of readiness that those games all embody at some point. He wants his followers to be ready to jump on a split second to do God's will or to be ready when they're called upon. And he looks for them to have that readiness in a constant sort of a way because when it comes to God's purposes, there's no shot clock ticking down. There's no calendar that we've been given. There's no way to be absolutely certain when God's purposes for the entire universe will be fulfilled. There's no way to know for sure when things will draw to a close. 
Jesus himself said about that day and that hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. It could be this afternoon, or it could be in another 7.84 million years. We don't know. And that's one reason why we need to be ready. And on point. Either way, whether it's soon or late, either way, whether we view what he's talking about from a cosmic perspective or a personal one, from the perspective of just being mortal, from the perspective of, of knowing that God has his purposes and his, his schedules that we know nothing of, or from the perspective where we say, yeah, you know, we're beginning to get old here, or I had that heart attack last week, it's made me start thinking. However it comes about, we are left with Jesus' direction to use whatever time we have for God and to use it very consciously. Keep awake, he said. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. It sounds almost as if Jesus himself were quoting a proverb when he told his followers to remember, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. And so since we don't know so very much, we have to do our best to act wisely. And that means to live the life that we have, to live it with a sense of urgency, to live it intensely. We don't do that every moment. Can you imagine what your blood pressure would be like if you decided truly to live every moment that way? Your life would be intense, but it would be shorter. Maybe, maybe not. But to use it wisely carries that intensity with it. Among the portraits at the back of this church, there is one of a, a woman who looks like she's wearing a bonnet that is way too big for her head. I like to think of it that way because the other way to think of it is to say that her head was too small for her bonnet. And, and that sounds really weird. But anyway, she's wearing this huge bonnet because she lived in the 18th century. Her name was Barbara Heck, and she was part of a group of German-Irish Methodists who emigrated as a community from Limerick to New York City in 1760. And like all immigrants at the time, like all immigrants pretty much any time, she and they had to work very, very hard for a while. And they had been doing that for about six years. And around 1766, actually in 1766, this we can date, she saw, um, some of the other members of the community, 
including a man named Philip Embury, sitting around one day, and they were playing cards. And on the one hand, it meant that they had finally been able to get over that first real push that an immigrant needs to make to solidify just a living in the new place. And they had some time for themselves, finally. But on the other hand, she looked and she said, they're wasting their time playing these cards. There are more important things. <laughs> so what she did, she ran over, she scooped up the cards that were on the table, she threw them in the fire, and she turned to Philip Embury and she said that in so many words, if he didn't start preaching and, and reinvigorating their faith, that they'd all be burning for a whole lot longer than those cards. Now, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of relaxation. And there's nothing wrong with a good game of rummy. Uh, I advise you not to gamble with it, but, you know, for relaxation, everybody needs some downtime. But she had a point, which is, how much of our time do we pour into things that really don't matter? If today it were somebody sitting there playing Minecraft or Fortnite or Tetris, she might simply walk over and push the power button and the screen would go blank. And the question would then be, well, from the person sitting there, hey, what do you do that for? And her answer would be, is this really how you want to spend your life? Or is there something else that you could be doing for God? By the way, it sounds like an idle story, or a cute story, or a quaint story. But when she got Philip Embury to start doing the things that he really needed to be doing, telling people about God's love, he ended up helping her organize a Methodist society that became John Street Church that eventually was the site, the headquarters, for the work that the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, did in Lower Manhattan after 9-11. They did not know it at the time. But what he was doing, playing cards, wasting his time in her view, If he had continued doing that, it might have gotten in the way of people who 235 years later needed a place that they could use to comfort people who had just lost a loved one in a terrible moment. There would have been no place where people could have proclaimed hope against terrorism. Where people could have proclaimed and did proclaim God's love for each one in the midst of absolutely awful situations. If he had kept on going and she had not called everybody on their use of time. Over two centuries later, it would have inhibited people from having a place to go and pray in those dark 
dark days. Time is a strange thing. Time is a really weird thing. But it belongs to God. And God uses time no less than any other aspect of our lives. No less than any other aspect of all creation. And uses it for his purposes and for his glory. And I guess what it comes down to is that we don't want to get in the way of that. Or even better, we want to go with it. For you don't know the hour or the day. Amen. Redeemer, come, with us abide, our hearts to thee we open wide. Let us thine inner presence feel, thy grace and love in us reveal. Holy Spirit, lead us on until our glorious goal is won. Eternal praise, eternal fame be offered, Jesus, to thy name. Amen.